Good afternoon, everyone. This is Diana Arias with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Loss, Grief, and Resilience in the Time of COVID-19. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to our WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Please take a moment to turn the volume on your computer up for best listening. Please note that upon joining the webinar, you have been placed on mute to avoid any background noise that may distract others from listening to the presentation. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host who will be able to assist you. You'll have the opportunity to participate with us today during the chat, using the chat box feature, which is located on the bottom right of your screen. If you do not see the chat box, the speech bubble at the bottom of your screen. You can submit your questions to all panelists in the chat box throughout the presentation. Once again, thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Dr. Anthony Salerno. Thanks so much, Diana. Uh, this is Anthony Salerno uh, with, uh, with CTAC. Uh, I just, this is really uh, one of the most important topics I think that we look to address and one of the most challenging topics. Um, you know, we, we've heard from organizations that one of the consequences of uh, COVID-19 is that they've lost a number of um, you know, staff, um, uh, clients that they serve. And it's been an issue that um, we've heard more and more from various organizations. And so what we've put together really is a series to re begin that conversation, uh, to, to, to really learn a little bit more about the grieving and loss process, um, and also to hear from all of you and invite all of you to engage in that, in that conversation and really find ways to increasing our understanding of the grief and loss uh, of how we can be most supportive uh, to our organizations. So we're going to begin uh, really this series, and we'll tell you more about the uh, subsequent offerings uh, with Dr. George uh, Bonanno, who is a professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University. And he's done really a lot of pioneering research in this whole area of bereavement and trauma. And there's a the science behind many of these. And he heads the Loss, Emotion, and Trauma Lab at Columbia University. So his studies have really documented our natural resilience to these uh, events and explored the factors that help us cope much more effectively. And this is, you know, the whole repertoire of our emotional reactions into loss, especially positive emotion, and even the where laughter, personality, in the context really of our entire lives. He's the author of a really very important book in this, in this topic area called The Other Side of Sadness, What the New Science of Bereavement Tells Us About Life After Loss. So I just want to welcome Dr. Bonanno and really appreciate his uh, spending some time with us to increase our understanding uh, of what this, the grief and loss process is and how we can use that information to kind of make decisions as we go forward in addressing some of the losses folks have experienced. Let me turn it over now to Dr. Bonanno. Thank you, Tony. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can see and hear this just fine. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know about bereavement from the, what the work has shown us. So I'll begin with a, a brief overview of variations and how people respond to loss. And this is, is more, I think, scientific and statistical, this beginning part, just to give you an idea of what we really have learned in the last. 20 years or so. A lot has happened in the last 20 years in terms of learning about loss. And then we'll talk a little bit about predictors, some of the things that predict who will be resilient and who will show other types of patterns. Then we will talk a little bit about what grief actually is. And, and again, there's a lot of science here that tells us what, what happens when we're grieving. And finally, we'll, we'll, I'll close with a little bit of a review, very brief, of what bereavement ceremonies seem to do and the function they serve, because of course right now this is a big question that many people have, is what when we can't do these kinds of ceremonies. So we'll look at what those ceremonies actually do. Okay, so I'll jump right in here. I begin often when I speak with this slide, bad things happen, because this is what I study, the things that happen to us like this, and many things like this happen to us in the course of our lives, much more than we often realize. And of course, people die, people important to us often die. It's inevitable, grief is inevitable, it's just really a part of life. And of course, right now, it's been a big part of life for many people. Now, the things like loss and trauma, these major life events are poignant, they're 
They're difficult, they're costly, they're disturbing. And that point is in that cost has driven both clinical inquiry and scientific inquiry to focus on psychological damage. It makes perfect sense because there is psychological damage and we want to understand that. So we've developed things like post-traumatic stress disorder, prolonged grief disorder, uh, persistent complex bereavement disorder in the DSM. And these, um, the development of these disorders have led to great advances in research and treatment, but it's, they're limited also in very important ways if we want to understand the larger picture. One, and I'll, I'll just get into this briefly, um, this focus on disorders canonizes, di canonizes diagnoses. It ignores the fact that there are limitations to diagnoses. And, but the limitations are important in what they tell us about grieving. First of all, they're not very scientific. We, we decide in, in committees, you know, what the diagnosis should be. And the criteria are somewhat arbitrary. So when we're using diagnosis, we're actually leaving people out of the picture if, because of arbitrary criteria. But the symptoms are also heterogeneous. What I mean by that, uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. So this is um, a paper done by one of my former students, Isaac Alter Levy, and Richard Bryant is a very renowned trauma researcher. This is on PTSD. But what they did was they used binomial equations to elucidate possible symptom combinations. It's basically they, they, they looked at how many possible symptom combinations you could have and still have the same disorder. And what they found was for the DSM-4 PTSD diagnosis, it was about 80,000. For the DSM-5 diagnosis, it went up to over 600,000 because the DSM-5 diagnosis added another criteria. And that seems almost impossible, but it's quite true. If you, you have so many different symptom categories and a little bit of this and a little bit of that for the diagnosis, you end up with this tremendous heterogeneity. So different people can have the disorder with completely different profiles. So when we're only using a disorder, we're missing a lot. Now, the same is actually true for the bereavement diagnosis. It's not quite as bad for persistent complex bereavement disorder, which is the DSM diagnosis. It's 37,000, 37,000 different symptom combinations. The ICD, the International Classification of Disorders, introduced prolonged grief disorder this year. That's much simpler. In fact, they don't actually have a diagnostic algorithm. So they have only 48 um, different possibilities. But even with this simple, simple approach, they still have 48. So that even when we have a simple diagnostic category, we still have different profiles of people showing the same diagnosis. So that's a problem for trying to understand it. The bigger problem though with only relying on diagnoses, they're useful, but when we rely on them, we, we fail to count for other responses. And that's a little bit like defining health as the absence of disease. So if we have a couple of people in a room and they didn't need, none of them have a physical disease, we wouldn't necessarily say they're all equally healthy because there are variations in health. And it's the same thing for psychological health, for mental health. There are variations in people's level of mental health. So I like to think of this graphically. Here we have a PTE, which is a, a phrase I use, an acronym for potentially traumatic event. And in this case, we're talking about loss today. So a loss, we have a continuum of time on the bottom and then we have a continuum of symptoms and distress on the vertical axis. When we do that, when we have that and we graph people who have chronic psychopathology, it looks a little bit like this. You have elevated symptoms and distress for several years or longer. That's what we get when we have chronic psychopathology. There's some variation, but it's elevated. Now, most people do not develop psychopathology after a loss or a trauma. So those people are in the only remaining category we have which is non-psychopathology, it's so just a not psychopathology. But when you see this graphically, you can see right away, we have no idea where they are on the graph. If this is all we have, the diagnoses and everything else. We don't know what it looks like. So we don't know what all the people who are, have suffered a loss who might be still struggling or maybe not, we just don't know if they don't have the diagnosis. And that's a problem, that's been a problem. Now, one way that people sometimes think about this is in terms of averages. We say, well, grief on average is difficult, but that's actually misleading as well because, well, for, for many reasons, and people have talked about this for years, um, the average is often mistaken for the mode. Now, what that means, that's a bit of statistical jargon, simple jargon, but what it means is that people assume, we tend to assume that the average is the most common response, but it's not always the most common response, especially after things like, highly adverse events like losses. It's often driven by extremes. 
And this slide just simply shows you these, these quotes here that people have been saying this for like a century. You know, they're, they're quotes from chemistry, experimental psychology, B.F. Skinner is on here somewhere, uh, mathematics, economics. It's widely understood in many different fields that the averages don't tell us very much. So this is until recently, this is all we've known. We've known about psychopathology. We knew on average something like a loss was really difficult. And when I began my career, now a long time ago now, um, about 30 years ago now, I shudder to think, but yes, it's about 30 years ago. Um, I was interested in this area on the graph where, where people would go through a loss and remain relatively healthy. That was assumed to be rare. And people thought, though, if it does happen, those people are exceptionally good copers or there's something wrong with those people. And that's still a very common assumption in our field that if that people don't grieve, there's something wrong with them. There was a phrase that was very common once, it's still out there called absent grief which basically means you've had a loss and you're suffering from the absence of grief. There's something wrong. It's considered a pathological condition. And uh, this was a survey done in uh, already now 1993, a long time ago, but 65 experts at the time uh, agreed that absent grief existed and that it was the result of denial or inhibition and it was maladaptive. And there are quotes here from a number of prominent people who thought that, uh, that this idea of like the not consciously grieving was disordered. It was a personality pathology. People who did this were cold and unfeeling or they were only superficially attached. So this was floating around for a long time and there's still some, some ideas like this. People come up to me all the time and tell me that in fact this stuff is true and I'm wrong, um, which I'll let you be the, the, the judge of that. Um, so what I began to do about two decades ago was begin to map Try to map these different patterns rather than relying on the diagnoses or just these, these ideas about what it should look like if people don't have the diagnosis. We set out to map the different patterns that we would see. Initially, we did this using just mapping different patterns of outcome prototypical trajectories. Initially, we did it by hand. We didn't have any tools yet, and we did it very primitively. And then, of course, now we have such computational power, we, we use different kinds of latent computational models and, and such. I won't go into that in any detail, but I just want to show you the result of that. In 2004, I published this paper, um, which, in which I first laid out, these were the, what I thought were the major patterns that we see. Now, that's a kind of a manic graph. Um, here's a better one. This is the same, the same patterns, only smoothened a little bit. We have a lot more data. We've collected data now for 20 years, over 20 years on these patterns. And we have a better idea of what they look like and how prevalent they are. I'm going to just walk you through this quickly. So of course we have this chronic trajectory. This is a lot like chronic psychopathology, only this is derived from um, modeling. We were not using diagnosis here. We're just identifying a group of people who have elevated symptoms for a long time. And the range is between 5 and 30 percent uh, for both loss and trauma. 30 percent is extraordinarily high. We rarely see that. Usually it's around 10 percent. And with grief, typically it's 10 percent or less. So the, the, the studies that we have now have really made it clear it's about 10 percent or less of the people who, who bereaved are likely to suffer from chronic symptoms, chronically elevated symptoms. Now, 10% may seem like not very much, but it's actually an enormous amount of people given how common grief is. One in 10 people, which is quite a lot, will suffer for a while. Then we have this pattern of, uh, we call recovery. People struggle for a while, then get better. And then we have this pattern, um, which we call delayed symptoms. Now you can see here, it's, 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 it's kind of like a moderate level of symptoms that don't go away, get a little bit of worse. Historically, people assumed it looked like this. There was the idea in the, in the literature when I first began my career that there were people who looked fine, this is the absent grief idea again, but look fine, but they're really not well because they're suppressing their grief or they're in denial, and eventually they're gonna have this eruption of symptoms and show, suffer delayed grief. That became kind of mythical because there's never actually been any evidence that that happens. And we don't see that. We do see this after traumatic events, but we actually don't even tend to see this pattern during bereavement. So we actually haven't seen the phenomenon of delayed grief in our research or in other people's research either, where we have you know, large samples of people and we look for patterns. We don't see that pattern. 
Finally, the most common pattern we see across all our studies is this one called resilience. And you might remember this is the bottom of the graph where it was thought that there weren't many people. And I began studying this pattern when I first began my career. Turns out this is the modal response. This is the most common response across all the different studies. The majority of people will show this response. They suffer for a very short time, sometimes a few days to a few weeks only, but they're able to continue functioning. They're able to show that pattern. And what I mean by what that means is essentially they're not having a lot of symptoms. They're able to concentrate, they're able to be present, to, to be emotionally involved with other people and to function in their life uh, pretty much soon after the loss. The majority of bereaved people in the studies we've done and other people's studies have shown this pattern. This slide um, shows you uh, just some of the studies that have been done recently. There's a lot of work in this area now for, for loss and other kinds of traumatic events. The studies with the little asterisk on the left um, are the studies that have come from my lab and the, among the recent studies. And you can see across all these events, so bereavement is on here, traumatic injury, combat deployment, spinal cord injury, mass shooting. Across all these studies, that resilient pattern of relatively few symptoms and basic health um, is the majority, is more than half of the people in the studies. This um, slide just tells you recently we did a, a review of 67 studies using these kind of trajectory model. And across all these studies using different methods, about two thirds on average showed the resilient trajectory. So that's, I think, for me, what we typically will see now. About two thirds of the population will show this kind of resilience to just about any aversive event, including bereavement. Now, I want to tell you about one particular study because this study taught us a lot about uh, grief. We can get into this one in a little bit more detail. This was called the Changing Lives of Older Couples study I was involved in. And we published this quite a few years ago, but this was a prospective study. It was the first prospective study ever done. And what that means is prospective is that we had people, we were able to, to study people before the loss happened. It's not easy to do, but in this study, we were able to do it. So we had 1,500 people from the Detroit area. This study was done out of the University of Michigan. So the Detroit catchment area was the area of the study. And people were followed for seven years. 205 people lost their spouse during that seven year period and had been interviewed prior to bereavement on average three years earlier. That was super important because at the time there were all these ideas about, you know, people who are resilient or people who are looking healthy. There's something wrong with those people or we, you know, we want to know who they are. So we were able to look at that in this study because we'd interviewed them on, on average three years earlier. And then they were also interviewed several times afterwards. We graphed the, 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 uh, their depression levels into these trajectories. I'm going to go through this quickly because I'll go back and show you these again in a minute. This is a, the same data, only now for the full seven years. Um, so you can see we had that resilient pattern in there. Um, this is uh, the same data again done more recently. We use much more complicated statistical modeling to do this. The Band-Aid looking thing, we should have chosen a better color, sorry. That thing is, that that's the period of time when the loss occurred. So we had data before and after the loss. You can see that X where people are switching patterns before and after the loss. And then this study is a different data set. This is just another study we did more recently with another national data set where we could go before and after the loss. And we found more or less similar patterns. Now I'm gonna go back to the one I just showed you. This is the clock data set again. This is the study I first mentioned in Michigan where we had 1500 people. And I want to just walk you through what we found here. So first of all, we found this resilient pattern. I put a line through it. It's a little bumpier than that, but it's more or less flat. This was about two thirds of the sample. So this sample showed, this is depression. They showed really no depression before or after the loss. It's pretty much stable trajectory. Undoubtedly, there was a little bit, there were a little bumpiness in there right when the loss happened. That's, that's, that probably goes without saying, but for the most part, whenever we followed them, they looked healthy. Okay, so who were those people? First of all, there was no delayed grief in this study. They were not unhealthy on any of the measures we had before the loss. Their marriages were right in a normal range. The interviewers thought they were just like normal people. They weren't cold, they weren't socially inept. So there was nothing of that kind of idea that there's something wrong with these people. None of that was evidence in this study. 
And we did see that they were they scored higher than other people on some protective factors. They they saw that the world is a just place. They thought, well, yes, the world is sort of fair. Um, they scored high on a scale that we had at the time called acceptance of death. And basically, this asked them questions like, you know, do you is death? You know, how do you feel about the statement death is just a part of life? It happens. If death happens, we have to move on, et cetera. And they, these people scored high on that. It's two thirds of the sample. And they had instrumental support. In other words, they had people in their lives who could provide help when they needed, instrumental kind of help, not social support, but instrumental support was really important. Okay, so we have this group. And we also saw this pattern in the study, this blue line. Now we'd never seen this before in the study. I was really surprised when we saw this. Since then, we've now seen this in a number of studies. These are people who were depressed, very highly depressed before the loss, but they were no longer depressed after the loss. And as I said, we were a little baffled by this at first, but then the reason became apparent. And now, if I could talk with you right now, I would ask you what you thought uh, was causing this pattern. Um, I suppose we could use chat, but that's a little awkward. I'll just, I'll, I'll just cut to the punchline. These people were caregiving for an ill spouse. Now caregiving we know is enormously stressful. So people who are caregiving are often depressed because, and especially caregiving for a person who's dying because they're caregiving for somebody that they know is going to die. And so that the stress of managing all these tasks at once and caregiving for an ill person, watching them be ill and knowing they're going to die is, is depressing. And we've now, as I mentioned, seen this in a number of studies. It's as if they do the grieving during the caregiving. And when the, when the loss happens, it's over for them. They're, they're, they're not, they're relieved. I think they say they're relieved. It's not that they're happy the person's dead, but they're relieved the stressor is gone. Now in this particular sample, they also had, this group also had poor quality marriages. So that's a tough road to hoe. These are people who are caregiving for an ill spouse who's going to die. They also aren't getting along with. That's hard, that's very difficult. And not surprisingly, they were introspective and emotionally unstable, but they also reported the levest, lowest levels of instrumental support. They didn't have a lot of people helping them. And they felt that the world was, it was particularly unfair for them. So they scored high on a little scale that we had, personal injustice with questions like, everybody gets the breaks but me. This group endorsed that item. Now I mentioned, we've seen this pattern in other studies, even other non-bereavement studies. We've seen this in mass shooting studies, we've seen this in the military. There are groups of people who, who are struggling and when something highly aversive happens, they're actually not struggling anymore for complicated reasons. We've always been able to find a reason. And in this particular case, it was caregiving. Now, if you, you, you'll notice that these, the, the, the blue group, the, the group that was depressed and improved then, the resilient group, the red group, look about the same during bereavement. And in fact, they were about the same on all the other measures. They were both healthy during bereavement. Both of these groups were lowest in grief symptoms. They were low, they were processing the loss lower than other people. They were not searching for meaning and they were not engaged in avoidance and distraction. They did have the highest levels of positive affect and, and a very important variable we've learned in this study was that they, they get comfort from positive memories of the deceased. People who cope well with grief often report this, that they're able to generate or garner comfort when they have positive memories. They're able to generate positive memories and, and those memories are comforting. Okay, we also saw some other patterns in this study. So we saw this pattern, chronic grief, and this is of course not a surprising pattern at all. People who were not depressed before the loss to the left of the, of the Band-Aid area, and then they, they became quite depressed, at least through the first 18 months, the next time we measured was 48 months, four years later, and they were no longer depressed. So some point in that time, they, they, they moved towards recovery, but it's a long time to be depressed. So at least two or three years of depression there, maybe four for some. So this is their classic kind of chronic prolonged grief response. But we also, because this is a prospective study, we were able to identify a group that was chronically depressed before and after. Now, that's not surprising either, but because we had these kind of data, we could separate these two patterns. Again, during bereavement, sorry, during bereavement, these two groups are not that distinguishable. And it turned out when we looked at the pre-loss variables that predicted these groups, that a lot of the things that were characteristic of the chronic depression group, the group that was depressed before and after, were things that had been 
mistakenly assumed to be predictors of grief, of complicated grief. So the, the group that was chronically depressed before and after had very poor marriages. They were emotionally unstable. They had low perceived coping efficacy, which is none of this is surprising. They thought that they were not very good at coping. And they really felt that negative events were uncontrollable, which is also not surprising. So what then, those things did not predict complicated grief, the, the chronic grief group. So what predicted chronic grief? What we learned in this study, I think was very important. The best predictor of what was, of what, who would have chronic grief was excessive dependency. And we found that it was both in general, they, they endorsed items. We had some, some questions in the interview about just the world in general, and they felt that they needed other people. They were very dependent on other people, but also in the relationship they had. They, were, they felt that they, they, they said things like, I couldn't live without this person. This was before the loss. They were saying these things. And then during the loss, they showed this chronic uh, pattern, the chronic reaction to grief. Now, I think the reason this makes a lot of sense because one of the key symptoms when we when we break down, I didn't go into this and I won't go into it, when we break down the grief into the, the most meaningful symptoms, there are lots of people who are doing this kind of statistical modeling. Now, identity loss is one of the key symptoms, one of the most important symptoms that determines when somebody's really going to suffer a long time. The sense of I've lost a piece of myself and it's gone. I've have a, 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 a part of me is missing and it's not coming back. People who have more robust involvement in life, you know, they have a work identity, a home identity, a family identity, a social identity. They play, you know, I don't know, they play music in, in the park in the afternoons, whatever they do. Um, they have different pieces of their identity and the loss is not as quite a big hit. But if people are suffering from tremendous dependency on the relationship, they tend to feel like a huge part of them is gone now. And they really suffer for that. So that's a kind of a very important thing we know now about what, what to look out for in predicting complicated reactions. Now I wanna take some time and um, reflect a little bit on what, what this means. So when we think about pathology as a dysfunction of the normal resilience process, you know, the early work on bereavement um, emphasized that uh, was really based on, on clinical understanding of pathology. But when we began to study resilience, we realized, okay, we, we know what resilient people do and, and pathology is a, is a sort of a dysfunction of that normal process. So what is that normal process? And what we found in a number of different studies is that uh, most bereaved people, including resilient people, experience intense sadness, very intense sadness and yearning early on. These are time limited and adaptive. So these are actually adaptive reactions. The intense sadness and yearning help us get over the loss for a short period of time. They're designed to be, well, we, we can speculate, they're designed from, by evolution to get the job done in a sense. So let's look at that. What is sadness exactly? What would be the function of sadness? Why do we feel sad? These are really important questions we can ask. And there's lots of research on sadness. There's a great deal of research on sadness. Um, and what that research has shown us is that um, we have reduced physiological arousal, the world slows down. We actually become more accurate. We, we're less prey to automatic thoughts when we're sad, which is very interesting. And people have used the phrase sadder but wiser. And we're also more focused on the present. Now, I want to show you a little example. Of, this is a, a little study we did. I won't tell you the details of the study, but this is called the delayed reward discounting study. And what, what this is is, and you may be familiar with these kind of things. People are given um, offers of money. Say, look at the top panel, fourteen dollars. I'll give you fourteen dollars now, or I'll give you thirty dollars tomorrow. What do you want? So most people will take the thirty dollars, but I'll give you fourteen dollars to today, or you can have thirty dollars next week. Now some people will say, "No, give me the money now." By the time we get up to, to next year, a lot of people are just saying, "Just give me the money." This is New York, man. Give me the money. Um, we can do this in many different ways and vary this and you can give $100, the bottom panel will say $100, I'll give you $100 now or I'll give you $200 or $500 next year. And people will take various amounts, but the curves tell you that the longer people wait, you have to wait, the less likely people are to take the money in the future, even if it's more money. Bereaved people do this more steeply. The dark line has occurred for bereaved people. Bereaved people are more likely to say, just give me the money now. I don't have a future. The future is some vague thing. I'm in pain. Give me the money now. So this is a, was a good way of getting at it, one way of illustrating that. 
But what this all means is that this, all this sadness, this sadness and these functions, they're giving us basically a timeout. We're recalibrating. We're taking stock of what we're lost. We're focusing inward. We're not paying attention to the world around us. Our bodies are slowing down and we're recalibrating. You know, the person that we lost, the person that we're attached to is in our heads. Often we're not with that person. They're in our heads most of the time. Um, and when we lose that person, they're still in our heads, but we have to reconcile some other. We're never going to physically see them again. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy for our minds to do that. We have to kind of work that out. And we have to take stock and really accept this person is physically dead, even though I can still call them to mind. I can still dream about them. I can still talk to them in my mind. They're physically dead and I will never see them again. And that's very hard to do. And sadness is the process where we turn inward and sort of sit with that. And it's painful, but it's what, it's what happens when we're sad. This, this is how we work it out. The other thing, though, that happens when we're feeling sad is we're consolidating a memory of the person. We're kind of going through all our memories of the person and thinking about them. And we're coming up with kind of a summary of that person that we'll use, we'll take forward with us. This is who the person was. And it's somewhat idealized. We tend to be a little bit generous here and forgiving. So, um, but th this is basically what we have. We remember the person this way and we go forward. Now, we, we were thinking about this when we studied, uh, when we were studying bereavement. Um, is it possible that there's too much idealization? Maybe the people who are dependent are, are idealizing too much, or maybe people who suffer the most are too lost in this idealization process. So we went back to these data we had earlier that I mentioned, the clock data, where we had these different patterns, and we had asked people actually to rate their marriage and rate their partner positive and negative before the loss and each time we talk with them. So we had these measurements over time. So we looked at it. And I have to admit, I was completely surprised when we saw this. This is what it looked like. The people who were healthier had better marriages. The people who were less healthy had, had poorer marriages. But over time, everybody, those, those group differences never changed. Over time, everybody ramped up. Everybody idealized about the same, a little bit, like they took it up a notch or two and then kept it there. So everybody grieving did this same thing, all the different groups. I don't mean every single person, but all the different groups on average did this kind of idealization. This is a product of what happens when we're grieving, and it seems to be the same for more or less everybody. So why do we show sadness? I like to ask this question. We don't have to show sadness. We're thinking sad, we're feeling sad. Why do we have these expressions? What's that for? Why evolutionarily, why do we do that? This is a classic sad face. This, this guy in particular, his eyebrows are in and up. That's the, the Darwin called that the grief muscle. And you can also see the, the cheeks pulled down. And that's what you see in bereaved people. And this very much sad face. These are pictures I just found on the web. This photo in particular, you can see the, the, the cheek being pulled down. And it's this classic thing we, we do, what we show when we're sad. So why do we do that? It turns out that that expression evokes sympathy in other people. And there's lots of research showing this. When, we, when people see other people making that face, they feel sympathy for them. They want to take care of them. And so while we're, and I think this is marvelous, while we're struggling, we're turned inward, we're trying to understand the loss. At the same time, we're showing this face that makes people want to take care of, care of us. It, it affirms their connection to us. And it does tell other people, we're, draw, we're not paying attention and I might need your help. And in fact, people do take care of other people when they see that face. Now, I just want to tell you about this briefly. This is, um, I got interested in the work of Jane Goodall, the very famous primatologist who worked with chimpanzees in Gombe. And she published a lot of scientific work. And some of her scientific work she saw in, in young chimpanzees who lost their mother, she saw sadness, depression, and grief, at least what looked like sadness, and depression, and grief to her. And chimpanzees who, who lose their mother need to be picked up by another uh, caregiver in the, in, the in, the, in the tribe, usually a female. Uh, especially the under, those under three, they still need mother's milk. So another mother in, another female in the, the whatever it's called, herd, a tribe, the chimpanzees, must take them on, must adopt them. 
the, ch the chimpanzees, some of these bereaved chimpanzees don't survive. And Goodall had observed that those that didn't survive looked listless and lethargic, and they showed this kind of weepy, sad, sad expression. And they, and they also had developed very ambivalent and difficult relationships with the caregiver that picked them up, and many of them died. We see the same thing in humans. There's been a lot of research on humans. Prolonged expressions of sadness and distress tend to drive away supports. Because those expressions pull people toward us, over time, the, the supports in our life get tired of that, and they begin to avoid us or, or move away from us. So these expressions, too, are also time limited. And what this says basically is they're adaptive, but they can't go on for, for too long. Now, just to talk very briefly about bereavement rituals, just to finish up, there's obviously a great variety of bereavement rituals. And I spent a lot of time looking into this when I wrote my book about 10 years ago, the other the book, The Other Side of Sadness, and um, I've sort of followed this over time. Um, what's interesting about this, even though there's a tremendous variability in these rituals, there's also some commonalities. And what's common across all these bereavement rituals and rites is that they seem to facilitate the things that we already we now know naturally are part of grief. So they seem to augment or help those natural grief functions. So one, for one of the things that bereavement rituals do is they help us foster the creation and consolidation of an enduring summary of the person. Remember, I thought sadness does that. When we're sad, we create kind of a, a memory of the person that we take forward, a summary of them. The bereavement rituals do that also. They, people tell stories, they share memories, and they're very forgiving. People don't go to a funeral and say, let me tell you what, a, what an asshole this person was. Forgive me for using that word, but this is New York, sorry. Um, generous, forgiving, not too critical. So um, we, have this, um, we have this social right that augments what we already do naturally. The same social right, all these social rights also reaffirm the social bond. Everybody that participates in memorial service and funeral knows the deceased person mostly, or they know the, the bereaved person, and usually they know them both. And bringing all these people together reaffirms for the, for the living, for the survivor, that they're still part of this really broad social circle. It's like a social circle or network with the, bereaved per, the, the deceased person at the hub, but the bereaved person is in that hub too. And it reaffirms you're part of this community. And some rituals do this very, very explicitly. And it also allows people to care for the survivor. So what's interesting about all this is that we naturally do these things anyway when we're grieving. We're wired to do that, I would say. We have the sadness reaction that helps us do things and tells other people that we need their help. But we also have developed social rituals for these things. Now, I, I brought this up in part because this is something we, we really can't do so much right now during the COVID epidemic, and that's been very difficult for people. And we can talk about that if anybody's interested in that, what other things people have been doing in order to try to make that happen. Um, but that's really a broader point for discussion. So with that, I'm going to just say thank you to the people that have paid for all this research over the years and to say thank you to you for listening. Thanks so much, Dr. Bonanno. You know, as, as you were speaking, I was saying to me, you know, um, how come we don't study this? in graduate school, you know, as professionals, you know, very little exposure <clears throat> to this whole area and that there's a whole science to help us better understand the, the process of loss. And, you know, I'm thinking of maybe the folks who are on as well, who are social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, you know, people in the helping professions. <clears throat> this is like is an area, so much there. there's a lot of richness to this whole literature. And we have a lot of assumptions around what people go through and I think of all the patients that I worked with over the years <clears throat> where you know, I really didn't have any sense of the kinds of different patterns and that I would have been very attentive to. And so that's one of my first sort of like reactions to all, all of this. And with respect to the current situation, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, if I was a, um, a CEO of a hospital or program where uh, clients had passed away or staff had passed away, and I said, you know, I really want to be very attentive to the way in which coworkers might be responding to this or other patients uh, who uh, knew this a particular patient who, who passed away. Uh, you're, what I'm th thinking now is in a much more sophisticated way, is that to be very attentive to some of the, the possible patterns. Having yeah. a sadness and pain is, is almost, you know, of course, is part of a healthy response. The other is that most people are 
likely to do okay. Yeah. yeah. Majority will do will do okay. But there are some folks who may not do so so great. And I ought to be attentive to that. Yeah. And so what what do you think I as a leader or a supervisor or a coworker and and that I might observe in one of my coworkers or a client, one of the clients who, who lost a client or their therapist, are there something I should be particularly attentive to to know that this person really is is not really that is not responding in a way or responding in a way that can cause them more harm than good in the long run? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there, and, and there's not a, a one, there's not one answer to that question. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting given I, I live in a building in New York with lots of people and most people know that I do this kind of work. And when somebody in the building loses a loved one, um, I'll be in the elevator with people. And I've developed a, a habit over the years of not bringing it up, which may sound odd, but I think that some people really don't want to be left alone to, to grieve privately. Um, and in that case, it can be invasive to ask them about it. Um, so I let people know what I do, and I, they often will mention it, and then I will have to talk to them about it. When you're in a position of, um, a position of more, I think, supervisory or, or um, you know, with more uh, assumed role in the person's life, then I think it's important to ask, you know, a person how they're doing. Um, but you know, people also feel very self-conscious about it. And some people want to keep doing what they're doing. And this is very important. Some people want to keep doing what they're doing and have it separate from the law. They want to be able to say, my job is, you know, that's my job. And it's not bereavement. I can get away from the bereavement for a few hours in the day to do that job. So I think it's important to ask people, you know, if, if you think it's necessary, ask people, you know, how they're doing and what they want to do. People often know. Um, signs, I think, you know, I mean, people grieve very intently early on. Um, that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for people to be very upset in the first few weeks. Um, there is no clear point when that becomes problematic, but I think if people um, are looking really devastated, that's, that's probably a bit of a warning sign, um, especially over time. Um, and if you know anything about a person's life, you know, the, the, the one thing that really seemed to come to mind was the dependency idea, which is that if people seem to have other aspects of their identity that they still, that are mean, meaningful to them, and then that tells you they have, they have other things going for them. Um, and, you know, we also think that if, if, if all of you have single systems, you know that what are the kind of tools people have for coping with things. And, you know, the, this, is a, this is something to cope with. So whatever tools people have that they can use. And if we know a person has got other resources and other tools, then we know that they're, they're, they're going to be able to use those. Great. Thank you very much. We have a, some really interesting questions coming in. So, Dr. Bernardo, if you could share some ideas on how people are able to grieve their loved ones when they aren't able to gather for funerals and the social after a funeral, the disruption really caused by this whole COVID-19. Yeah, yeah that's, that, it, that's a great question. And it's a very, very difficult time, obviously. Um, I mean, people have done creative things. I mean, some people can't do, can't do these things, but, but um, I think the most difficult scenario is when, is when a couple, um, uh, when one member of a couple um, had to be hospitalized and died in the hospital and the other member of the couple um, had to be quarantined because they were living together. So that person, the, the surviving member of the couple, uh, can't see anybody else. That's very hard, very, very hard. Um, they can't go out of the house at all. Um, what that's an extreme case, but what a lot of people are doing, and what people were doing this before uh, COVID, and I think it's just been ramped up, is to do, um, to, you know, obviously contact people, family, friends, anyone that they thought knew the person, let them know. And I think people may be reluctant to do that. It might seem disturbing, but I think um, it, if the closest we can mimic a memorial service, the, the better. So letting anyone who knew the person know that that, that 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 person has died and inviting, we can invite them to submit or to send memories, pictures, you know, anything you want to share, we'd be happy to have it, you know, and, and people will do that. People will send it. And what, what some people have done is create online websites or Facebook pages or anything like that where, where people can post. And there are, there are a few companies that offer this kind of thing. 
and I've, I've actually participated in these things for when friends have, have been ill or died, um, but there, we, people can make their own too and just allow people to, to submit all these things. You know, and, they, and, and people will definitely participate in that. They'll send stories, they'll send photos, they'll talk to each other. Um, so that, that replicates it to some extent um, and, and allows those functions to take place. And also allows other people to reach out to the, the bereaved person and say, we're here, we're part of your life too, don't, you know, let's stay in touch. Um, you know, so that's part of it. And the other part I think very important is to realize what those functions are. And it's these two pieces that really stood out for me with doing this work was this kind of reviewing the person's life, the, bere the deceased person's life, and kind of creating a, a summary that we can take with us forward was very important. And our, our minds do this naturally anyway, but this is also something the ceremony does. But we can still make sure to do this for ourselves, whether we have the ceremonies or not. And also the part of reaching out to other people, staying connected to other people, as, as painful as that is, if we, we, you know, we don't reach out to other people and say, hey, what are you doing? Let's hang out. But it's more, you know, I think it's, it's a question of, of, um, of telling people that the person has died and inviting them to, to, to share the process with, with us, with you, with, any, with, with, the, with the bereaved person. It's very, very important. And, um, you know, I, I think people may not realize that, that that's, that either that's possible or even appropriate or even wanted because other people will want to participate. Other people want to participate in a loss and they, it, it helps to invite them to do that. Great, thanks, thanks so much, Dr. Bonanno. We have, um, also I just want to invite folks, if you've actually needed or have done some of the things that Dr. Bonanno has just mentioned, where this the virtual uh, kind of way of memorializing the person Please share that with us in the, in the chat box if you've actually gone through this process and have found ways uh, to memorialize the person, show the kind of you know, respect to that person, to acknowledge that death, and a way for other people you know, to participate in that grieving process uh, in a helpful way. Please uh, ch you know, chat that in. Uh, we do have another question, Dr. Bonanno, that I'd like to share. So uh, we have from Anne Marie Pendleton to all of us. During this time, I think it has been challenging for people to think about bereavement and how to handle it in the workplace. So for example, whether to use bereavement time or wait until a later date when family can be together in person. Do you have advice for managers or colleagues in terms of what might be expected later on? I believe that trauma-related symptoms may become present as well for many people later on, as well as due to the nature of this situation and the complicated grief in, uh, you know, involved. So it's really around like timing and yeah. what, what might, uh, you know, when do you sort of oh, engage yeah. this, you know, if you have any thoughts about that. It's a fantastic question. It's really a fantastic question. I haven't actually um, had heard that question before. Um, I think, I think it actually makes most sense to, to engage in whatever bereavement, honoring participation at the, now at this time, because this is when it hurts. This is when it hurts for people. And it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it's going to help them to have them postpone it because that actually is very painful. And then people do memorial services sometimes a bit down the road because that's a broader kind of a process that invites a broader, more extended community. But I think when people are suffering grief at a loss, they're suffering it at that time. It doesn't go away. And I think that really, they, what they really need is at that time, they need people to be available to them. So I would suggest that I don't, I've not been too worried or not been, I don't think there's going to be a lot of delayed or extended PTSD symptoms related to the COVID event um, because it's not the kind of event that it's not necessarily a traumatic event. It's really, it's a very anxiety producing event and it's a very sad event for many, but the traumatic stress is not so prevalent. Well, of course, the exception are people who are working in critical care, um, but otherwise I think that's not so much the case. We have, you know, we actually some folks have shared some of the things that they've done, and I'd like to share that with you, Dr. Bonanno, yeah. get your, your thoughts about that. So for, uh, this is from Julia Torres, for a friend that passed, we did a Zoom memorial, everyone joined and we did a si uh, slideshow with pictures and shared memories. What, do, what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, that's fantastic. I think that's, fan that's fantastic. I think that's exactly, that's just a fantastic model. 
to have people on Zoom doing this slideshow and, and sharing um, you know, sharing pictures, that's that's fantastic. And I think you, if you can extend that to to make it ongoing, you know, letting people continue to share things, or even on anniversaries, letting people continue to share. But I, but I think that's fantastic. That's that's first rate. Yeah, that's really good. You know, not everybody's comfortable with Zoom, which makes it challenging. Um, yeah. Okay, I want to share. I'm going to share a couple of other uh, responses. A friend of mine who had a shiva online for his mother who died of COVID-19 said it was more meaningful than a traditional shiva would have been because friends and relatives came from all over, mm. would not have been able to come in person. That's sort of an interesting, uh, you know, observation. Really interesting. Actually, expand the number of people who were able to kind of contribute and participate in the in the grieving process. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's fascinating. And there are some little um, as bad as this has been for many people. There are some lessons to learn. This is one of them, definitely, that people can zoom in on video who wouldn't normally be there. That's very. That's great. I think it's great. Great. Uh, so you have. Uh, let me see. At one at my agency, we've lost a few members due to COVID-19. We have not openly let the rest of our population know but they are now starting to learn about the losses. Is it more beneficial or harmful uh, for staff, uh, that staff are not informing them of losses during this time? We have been fearful to tell them as if it's a difficult thing to process sort of via, uh, you know, via telehealth. You, you can see like sort of the tension of, you know, yeah. information when people are already, you know, stressed out. Any, any thoughts on, on, on that? Dilemma? Yeah, I, 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 the, the, the thought that comes to mind, these are all very, Interesting questions, but the comments by the way, I've heard some of these. This one in particular, um, I think it's a matter of the level of the relationship. If it's a person that is somewhere in the organization that that other people wouldn't know, then I don't think it quite. I think it's probably wise not to share that information because it's just another person has has been taken by the virus, right? So that's just kind of adding to the the anxiety of it. But if it's people that, that other people know, I think it's probably better to to let people know that person's lost someone so they can reach out and they can say, you know, I care about you or how are you doing, et cetera. So it's really about how much people would know the person. I think what's important here is, is that um, one thing is like sharing, but it isn't just like, well, I just want to let you know. It's not like a FYI. Yes. Don't you know, passed away, but to really think about the support for that person, if they could be invited in, in engaging in some of the things that you've already talked about in being able to share their experience. Yeah. That might be, you know, part of the equation uh, in, in trying to address this uh, individual. Yeah, and I think that it's it's difficult to know exactly how to, how to touch somebody by email, right? If it's somebody that you know kind of your work, um, and you reach out to them by email, it's not clear how much, if you know them well enough to say, you know, how are you doing? I hope you're well, let me know how you're doing. That's pretty straightforward. But beyond that, it's a little bit more difficult, you know, if it's not a person that you know well, because it's not clear how much to, to breach the confidentiality of it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share what we heard from Christina Siroy. Um, she, did she had a, um, a, a client unexpectedly pass away during this time. There were several programs in our agency that were involved in the person's care. We were able to schedule a WebEx call to talk with one another, offer support, share memories, and acknowledge the impact this client had on us, both in life and in death. We also discussed ways to acknowledge this loss to the family, as she had been a longtime client of our facility. Normally, this would have been done in person, but in the absence of this, we compiled names and programs who had worked with her over the years and sent this to the family with the message of sympathy and condolences. What are your, what are your thoughts about that, that, the way in which this organization handled it? Um, that seems like exactly the right way to handle it, I think, to, um, to reach out and to inform people. Um, and I think meeting to discuss it in a, in a way that you would have done in person, I think people do appreciate the chance. If, you, if it's something you would have done in person, I think definitely people appreciate the chance to talk, even if it's on a, on a video or on a phone or in any way, a chat, you know, anything that's possible. So I think it really, um, it touches the kind of 
the same dynamic that we would have in when, when we had the chance for in-person communication. That if it's somebody you would have seen, somebody you would have talked to, somebody you would have shared something with, then any way we can we can continue to do that through these alternative means is important, I think. And then for broader broader relationships where it's really just about sending information, that I think we can do that that same way as well. Terrific. We just have a few more moments left. So I just want this last question. Actually, I had this question in mind as well that we uh, uh, that that I was thinking about as we went on is while the evidence shows that most people will be okay because of the factors that you shared with us. In many cases, under the current conditions, those factors may not be present. Uh, so how how might this affect uh, the response to grief and loss? And and some of the do you expect that some of your findings might be a little different if if you were to do some of the studies you know, under these conditions. Yeah. Uh, any particular thoughts you have about, about that? Um, that's a fantastic question. It's a great question. And we are, in fact, doing a study <laughs> right now. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think that people are going to be okay from this. I don't think it's going to impact the percentages of people who are resilient and whatnot very much. And um, some of you may be surprised to hear me say that. But I've been now studying these kinds of patterns. You know, we've studied all, you know, we studied 9-11, people in the towers, we studied disasters, we studied terrorist attacks, um, mass shootings, and we always find that people are pretty much able to deal with it. Now, this particular event, um, you know, this event is not over yet, which, which, you know, means we really don't know yet. Um, but I think, you know, for the most part, um, people have handled it extremely well. People have handled the stress of this extremely well. And so I think um, the, the little um, data that I have just talking with people suggests that people are probably coping with this as well as they can. The one question may be whether there are going to be more people in that. I think there will be just as many people who are resilient as we always see with being resilient. People are just getting through it and being okay. The big question for me is that top trajectory, that trajectory of people suffering chronic difficulties, whether we might see more than usual in that pattern because of the nature of this and because of people not being able to say goodbye, having those un, um, you know, unacknowledged endings, not seeing their lost loved one, you know, until, um, you know, and not seeing them when they perish and not being able to see them. That could be extremely difficult for people, but I don't know yet. I mean, it, it may it may change it some, but I don't I don't know if it'll change it that much. So I, I'm really impressed by how resilient people are, uh, like in terms of falling into these patterns. But um, and it, so we could see a little bit more at the top, of it, but it's it's that still remains to be seen, and it's just hard. I, I think one of the one of the issues uh, that we may need to encounter in our in our field is that we have a lot of clients who are already struggling with some serious yeah. psychiatric substance use difficulties. And I, my guess is that a lot of the studies were not specific to individuals who had, you know, serious persistent mental illness or serious addiction. And I, I think that that might be one of the areas that we may, we may find that some of these patterns may not uh, hold in the same way. It's a possibility because of folks who are already experience a great deal of emotional vulnerability yeah. and, and challenges. And I, I'm wondering if that, that might be an area, you know, that perhaps we might want to revisit, you know, even as part of this series to kind of think about how, you know, in what way does the population of those who are very already quite vulnerable, whether or not those patterns hold, or we have to be a little bit more attentive to some of the risk. Uh, yeah with folks. Is that, does that make sense to you, Dr. Bonanno? That makes, that makes complete sense. And in, the, in, in the work we've done, we haven't seen a lot of that. You know, people are already doing poorly, continue to do poorly. They don't see a lot of increase. But I mean, it, this COVID situation is multifaceted. You know, there, every, there, there are so many different kinds of experiences people are having in this. In this. Some people are, you know, uh, essential workers and they're out every day putting their lives at risk. And other people are very stressed about losing their livelihood. And other people are suffering losses and other people are, you know, um, 
worried about their own health and and you know some people are are, are you know stuck in a tiny little apartment with with children and they're they're going crazy and other people have fled to the city and you know so a tremendous amount of variability in what this uh, this pandemic has has brought to people's lives so there isn't actually we can't really even actually say this pandemic how does it affect X Y and Z because the pandemic itself is is so multifaceted for different people. And that is something we just don't know. There's so many Thank unknowns you. to this at this point. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonanno. I think you're absolutely right. Um, we don't really know how the pandemic is really going to affect us yet. But I do want to thank you for this very informative um, information. I want to be mindful of the time. Um, so I want to thank you for your presentation. Um, Tony, I think there's a little bit of background on your end. Um, but I do want to point out to other individuals that we have additional trainings and resources available on our website. I also want to invite you to additional offerings. Um, some are COVID-19 related, uh, certainly to support you in your continued work. And I do want to point out that um, at the end of this, you'll be receiving a feedback survey. Certainly, please uh, take the time to fill it out. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, again, visit our website, cpacny.org, for additional trainings, events, announcements. And you will see a link to the website on your right-hand side. Um, and again, once again, Dr. Manano, thank you so much. And on behalf of CTAC, thank you everyone for joining us and have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Banano.